By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today I am playing a game against David, a brand new patron of the channel. And he's bringing a uh, white and black deck that I've called Abyss Knights to the table. It's quite interesting. Um, and I'm playing against him with a Tax Edge deck that, um, that I'm working on, that I'm brewing on. Maybe you saw Mail Day where I kind of discussed the cards. Now, before I start with the deck deck section of this video, because I've got lovely deck photos once again of both of these decks, I would first like to point out that as always, you can also choose to skip this section, go to the uh, games first, maybe do the deck decks later. I know some of you prefer to do that. The easiest way to do this is by first checking the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One of the timestamps reads MTG Games. Click on there. It'll take you straight to the action. And in that same description below, you can also find a link to my Patreon page. That is patreon.com slash timmytalks. And uh, via Patreon, you can become a patron of the show, a sponsor of the show. And uh, you can help me continue making this content for you. So if you enjoy the videos that I make, please consider becoming a patron. Check out patreon.com slash timmytalks to find out how you can also support the channel just like David. Um, okay, now that you're fully informed, we're going to continue with the deck decks. I'm going to start with the deck of my opponent. Let's take a look at Abyss Knights. And here we see the deck of David. So I've called it Abyss Knights for obvious reasons. Uh, we've seen two abysses and we see all creatures that are not affected by the abyss. So the abyss, maybe look at that first. It's a world enchantment or enchant world, I guess. Uh, from Legends that reads, at the beginning of each player's upkeep, destroy target non-artifact creature that player controls of their choice. It cannot be regenerated. Now, because you don't sacrifice it, but it gets destroyed by the Abyss, uh, Protection of Black actually works. So you can combine this with White Knight because it's a pro-black creature, so that's not affected by the Abyss. He's also playing with Suchis and Trikes. Again, they're artifact creatures, so not affected by the Abyss. Right, and then you also see a little land text sub theme in this deck. So we see two land texts here and a single Armageddon. And um, yeah, I think in general we see a lot of one offs in this deck, making it kind of hard to battle against it because you don't know what's going to happen. And of course, then we see that very like powerful white control package, right? Disenchants, Swords to Plowshares. I'm liking this combination of Swords to Plowshares and the Abyss because then early game you can sort away the early threats. And then late game, you've got your Abyss. Also, Disenchant is really nice early game to kind of take care of threats. Remember, old school, a lot of players play with uh, Mishra's factories. So Disenchant is, of course, great against uh, the factories. Now, one of the things that uh, he told me is that he actually took out the power for this matchup. Not sure why. Maybe it was in different decks. I'm actually playing with power in this match. So he took out the two Moxen and there's a Thower Stone and a Planes in here instead. So an extra Planes and an extra Thower Stone. Now, obviously, uh, the deck is a little bit better with the Moxen instead of those two cards. Now, when we're looking at the sideboard, we're seeing actually land text and two Armageddon. So he could go a little bit deeper on that strategy. We also see some City in a Bottles against Arabian Knight heavy decks. I don't think he's going to use that uh, in the matchup today. And we see a lot of artifact hate in there as well. So, I mean, when I'm looking at this deck at first glance, I think there are just a lot of answers. It's really like kind of a control deck, right? With that abyss, with all the creature removal, with of course the white control package. I also think that balance can be quite good in this deck because there are so many enchantment and artifacts in here. And of course balance doesn't count the non-creature artifacts and the enchantment. So I think this deck is very capable of playing a really good balance. And of course, because you're playing black, you've got access to demonic tutor, making those silver bullets even easier for you to find. Talking about silver bullets, we also see a uh, mind twist. I'm also really liking the single anime dead. I think it's really nice to play with singles because it makes your deck a little bit more like as a, a surprise to your opponent. And of course, that anime dead goes really well with the Triskelion in this deck. Uh, talking about one-offs, we also see one Winter Orb. Again, an interesting inclusion. And uh, it works with the one Icy Manipulator as well. So um, yeah, interesting. It looks like a good deck. He actually told me that he had a uh, top eight finish at uh, Africa, a really big old school uh, tournament in Norway. So that's quite an accomplishment if you consider that you're not playing with, with any blue power. So I'm sure you had to defeat a lot of blue powered decks to get to that top eight. Um, okay, so this is the deck of David. Looking really good, David. Now let's take a look uh, at my Lantex deck. Let's have a look. 
And here we see my deck, right? So this is uh, a new thing I'm trying out. So Lantex and Lance Edge, obviously not a new thing, but I'm combining that strategy with a Wrath of God strategy. I still need to come up with like a good name for this deck. So if you have one, let me know in the comments below. Uh, let me just explain what this deck wants to do. So you first have your Lantex, right? One white for this powerful enchantment from Legends that my opponent is playing with as well. And then during your upkeep, if you have less lands than your opponent, you can look for three basic lands, show them, and put them into your hand, shuffle your library, right? And then, then just draw your card for turn. Now, you can combine this with this other card, Lance Edge, which, which is an enchant world, by the way, so I can use it also to kill the Abyss, but I guess my opponent can also use it to kill my Lance Edge. But anyway, um, when you play this card, it says you can discard a card from your hand at any time, and when it's a land card, uh, it can deal two damage to your opponent. So when you combine Lantex and Lands Edge, you can just try to get enough lands in your hand to then kind of burn your opponent out. So that's one of the strategies. Um, now I've combined this with the strategy of Wrath of God, which is really like a thing I saw a lot, you know, back in the day when I was playing in, in 95. By combining Wrath of God with creatures that are actually not creatures, right? So you've got Mishra's Factory and Jade Statue, which are two creatures that you have to animate to become creatures. When you don't do that, they're just a land and an artifact. So if I play my Wrath of God and I don't animate these creatures, they're actually an artifact and a land are un and they are unaffected by the Wrath of God, right? So I cast Wrath of God, destroy all the, the creatures on the battlefield, and then I animate my creatures and attack with them, right? So that's kind of the thing I want to do. Now, uh, a really nice side note here in the whole building process is it has come to my mind that I could also add Rook Axe to this strategy. I think they would work quite well, but I just couldn't find space for them. So there are just a lot of, you know, things that I'm still considering for this deck. I don't consider this like a deck that's finished. Um, but yeah, you got to start somewhere. I want to start playing with it and, and, and see how it performs and then make some, some tweaks. So if you have some recommendations, please let me know in the comments below. Um, a thing that you may notice here is that I'm playing with three stone rains and that may seem counterproductive, right? Because I'm playing with Lantex, so Lantex and Stone Rain is kind of a non bow because when I destroy a land of my opponent, there's less of a chance that I'm going to be able to kind of ramp up, that I'm going to be able to activate and use my Lantex during the upkeep. But the reason the Stone Rain is in here is there are two reasons. First of all, I can use the Stone Rain on one of my lands, so I can use it to actually activate my Lantex. And when I have a Stone Rain in hand and I don't have the Lantex yet, I can just, you know, play out the lands and I don't have to worry about that. And then later, if I want to activate my tax, I can, you know, uh, have a well-timed Stone Rain and kind of get that advantage. Another reason is that there are so many good uh, non-basic lands in old school, I feel like you have to have an answer to that. I mean, think about a first turn Library of Alexandria, then you're really happy that you're playing with three Stone Rains. Now, obviously, another option in red is, and that's, I think, why you don't see Stone Rain that often, is to go with Blood Moon. Now, Blood Moon would also be an interesting uh, choice in this deck, and I thought about it. Um, the main reason I chose not to play with it is because I am, of course, really hoping to use my Mistress Factories in combination with the Wrath of God. So if I play Blood Moon, I'm turning my own factories into mountains. I mean, that being said, I maybe Blood Moon is the better way, maybe Stone Rain is the better way, but there's only one way to find out, right? And it is simply to play with the Stone Rain and see, okay, how does it actually work in, in practice? You know, is it really this kind of awkward card because you want to activate your tax, but you've stone range your opponent earlier in the game, or is it good because it can enable your tax, and if your opponent plays that one maze of if that you really want to get rid of, you can take care of it straight away with the stone rain, right? So those are kind of the things that are in the, in, in the back of my mind. Now, um, there's another component to this deck, and that is the transformational sideboard. So main board, I'm playing creatureless, but look at my sideboard. I've got four granite gargoyles, for Sarah Angel. So one of the things that I want to try out here against David is um, after the first game, if I've used my Lantex and Lance Edge, I want to board those cards out and make space for creatures. So hopefully what he's going to do in, in this matchup is, you know, take out his Abyss, maybe take out some more creature removal, put a lot of artifact hate in there and, and enchantment hate in there. And then in the second game, I'm going to surprise him with Sarah Angels and Granite Gargoyles. So that is something I'm definitely gonna 
gonna try if of course he's seen the land taxes and the lands edges if he hasn't then i can consider keeping that in the deck and not getting the creatures in but you know i feel like this transformational sideboard is just another little edge uh, that can make the deck better I'm, I'm just really really curious to see how it's going to perform there are just a lot of question marks still in the deck for example maybe i should add a jalem tome instead of a jam day tome because jalem tome works really well with like getting rid of, of the excess lands with the land tax. On the other hand, they want to keep the lands for the lands edge. Uh, another thing I've been considering is adding a library of Lang for obvious reasons, right? If you want to have a lot of lands in hand to kill your opponent in one go with the edge, you, you need more than seven lands in your hand, assuming your opponent's on 20, right? So then I would need a library of, uh, of uh, Alex, uh, sorry, a library of Lang. Um, again, these are all considerations um and i'm just gonna play and find out and and tweak some more and like i said if you have ideas for this deck uh, deck comments for this deck please let me know in the comment section below i'll be reading it and i always appreciate all the feedback that i get okay this is my deck we've looked at the deck of david and that means we're ready let's go to the match game number one here we go so it's david on the play starting with a scrub land an altered one there's a land tax okay so that's a pretty good opening for him i guess then again now i know he's got the tax so we're both playing with land taxes here um starting with the soul ring so i'm playing with my land tax uh lance edge deck that also has this Wrath of God sub theme. It's white and red. And my opponent, David, is playing Abyss Knight. So he's playing the Abyss White Knight. It's white and black. And he's also playing with land taxes and a single Armageddon in there as well. And a lot of artifact creatures also. Suchi, Strikes, they're all in there. There is another scrub land. I believe together they make a, a bigger picture. So he's going to try to get them all four. And I think that Soul Ring is uh, kind of bad here for David because it, because of that Soul Ring, I don't really have to worry too much about the land tax. Playing a Jade Statue here. So that's an artifact and I can pay two to make it a 3-6 creature. So this uh, card goes really well with Wrath of God, right? I can Wrath the board and because Jade Statue is an artifact and not a creature, it's not affected. And after that, I can animate the statue and attack. So David tapping two here. Are we going to see a disenchant perhaps? Ooh, no, there's a white knight instead. And now the question is, am I going to animate an attack? I mean, it is a bit risky if David has a swords to plowshares, for example. And remember, we don't know each other's decks, of course, when we're playing. So I have no idea that he's playing with the abyss, for example. So attacking here for three. First blood, putting David here on 17. He's going to draw a card for turn. Let's see what he can do. He can, of course, attack me back for two. There is a Mishra's Factory. Going to tap the factory here, it seems, untapping it again. And there he goes, attacking with the White Knight, dropping to 18. Tapping three, four. Okay, what are we going to see? A Suchi, perhaps? Oh! Mind twist for three. That is not cool. Do I have a response? Now, I remember thinking about this because I have a lightning bolt in hand so I could bolt the knight, but I also have some other cards in my hand that I want to keep. So I was thinking I'm not going to bolt it because then I have a bigger chance of keeping the card that I want, right? Is that a mistake? Time will tell. I mean, you have to make these decisions. So I consciously didn't bolt. And uh, there are my five cards. Let's see what cards I'm going to lose. So he's going to choose to do the three middle ones. Oh, a Lance Edge. A Swords to Plowshares. And a Strip Mine. Yeah, so that's kind of sad. Also, because now I'm showing him my, my Lance Edge. So he kind of knows what my plan is. Which is something you really don't want to share. Like, that's the advantage of the first game, right? That your opponent doesn't know that you're on a specific strategy. Unfortunately, that is now spoiled. Three cards in hand, passing the turn. So losing that sword, it's another card I could have played out. Perhaps I wanted to keep the 
lands edge in hand then again i'm playing three lands edges in the deck so i've got two more probably will draw into another one would be really nice for me if i can find one of my land taxes there's the animation he's gonna swing in he'll be able to deal five points of damage It looks like I'm going to do something, perhaps a disenchant. Yeah, disenchant here on one of the factories to kind of stop the bleeding. Taking two, going to drop to 16. So yeah, if I would have played the swords on the knight as well. But that's now water under the bridge, I guess. Animating, attacking for three. There's a swords though. That is a bit unfortunate. I am going to gain some life, going to go up to 19. Three cards in hand, it seems, and passing the turn. That other dice there shows how many cards I've got in hand. And uh, David was keeping me up to date verbally about his uh, card count, which is always kind of nice to know, right? When you play online, it could be a thing sometimes. It has an influence, of course, on your decisions to know how many cards your opponent has. There's the attack for two. So I'll drop to 17. Tapping three. Okay, there's a Jalem Tome. Untapping. Let's see what I can do. Still on 17. Playing another land. Tapping three here. Okay, there is an edge. So I found another one. What I really need here, though, is uh, another tax. Or another, but just a land tax. Ooh, there's the Abyss. Okay, it doesn't have a lot of effect on my deck. But now I do know like what his strategy is. So that's really good to know. Oh, of course. Yeah, it, uh, I discussed it in the deck deck. Of course, because it's an enchant world, there cannot be two enchant worlds together on the, uh, on the board. So it destroys my uh, Lance Edge. And I think I shouldn't have played out the Lance Edge at all because you don't want to play it out until you can kind of finish the game. So that was a mistake on my uh, part, in my opinion. And I'm getting punished for it. At least I've got Jade Statues and Mishra's Factories that are unaffected by the Abyss. He's going to draw a card for turn. I mean, if he can get rid of the Jade Statue, he can just continue attacking. That would be ideal for him, like having a disenchant, for example. He is animating and attacking, so I'm assuming he's got a, a swords here. Oh, look at this. Not doing anything? Looked like I wanted to play a bolt, for example. Choosing not to? Choosing to? I'm a little kind of undecisive here. Okay, taking the damage. Gonna go to 11. And then end of turn. It looks like I wanna bolt here end of turn. And I think this is a bit of a mistake and I can kind of explain that last card in my hand, if I remember correctly, is a Wheel of Fortune. So I want to empty my hand at the same time. Or is it a balance in, in there? It's one, of, it's one or the other. But what I'm worried about is I don't wanna activate his tax. Ooh, there's a disenchant on the jade statue so losing the jade statue here there is a planes okay so it was a balancing hand not a not a wheel of fortune so last balance so now i'm emptying my hand and obviously in hindsight what i should have done is just played a bolt before damage was dealt you know because i had the balance anyway to get the land count equal but i didn't realize that until the end step of David, so I already took the damage, so that was a bit of a misplace. It should have been on 13 here if I would have played it correctly. So playing the balance here, meaning that David can now uh, no longer use his decks, and of course he had to discard his hand, but I see a city in a bottle there, so that wasn't really uh, all that uh, valuable for him in this match. And passing the turn here after drawing uh, his card, I'm doing the same thing. So we're both kind of in top decking mode. But of course, he's got the Jalem Tome, so that gives him some card selection. Discarding here the uh, Lantex. And untapping now for turn. So he's going to draw a card for turn. So two cards in hand for him. I mean, this is looking good for David. Um, oh, he's going to disenchant the Soul Ring. Okay. Which I think is good because of that Lantex on David's side. He could put me in like an awkward position. Look at that. Actually tapping four mana. So giving him... 
a Lantex activation next turn, and he's got the Jalen Tome. Mm. This is a risky play by my side. I think my reasoning here is that David already has advantage because of the Jalen Tome, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to give you one tax activation, hopefully, uh, but I am going to draw some extra cards, and, you know, that can give me an advantage. So deciding to play land number four because of the Jalem Tome. I think if he wouldn't have had the Jalem Tome, I probably would have just continued top decking and we would just see whoever has the better top decks, you know, to win this game. But uh, the Jalem Tome kind of forced my hand here. So he's uh, showing three basics, shuffling up three planes, it seems. So he's not afraid of a Blood Moon. And I was going to draw a card for turn. So now his hand is nicely stocked. And that actually makes the Jalem Tome better. So I'm not quite sure if this is the right move. Hopefully my Jam Day Tome can stick and I can at least draw a card from it. We'll just have to wait and see. Four is about the max amount of lands that I need or mana that I need. Here we see a Mana Vault. Oh, so it looks like he's not even playing out that land so he can activate the tax again next turn. Ooh, look at this. Okay, finding a disenchant, that's actually pretty good. So now I have to decide what to take care of. I guess I have to go for the tax, right? Because he's got a tax activation. Very tempting here to go for the Jalem Tome instead. The Mana Vault, also an okay target. But um, yeah, I just went for the tax here. Also because he had an active tax activation still going next turn. So that would have been three more cards for him. But it, it's a difficult decision because Jalem Tome also in this situation is really, really good. And now he's got six mana. Remember, he's playing with uh, four Suchis and four Triskelions, so he could uh, cast a Trike here. That would be a little bit disastrous for me. I've got no cards in hand, remember that. He's tapping four for a White Knight and an Anime Dead. Ooh, on a Trike. So that trike probably got there from the balance earlier in the game. It's looking really bad for me. That's five damage on the board. He can put me on six. And he's got, of course, a three plus one plus one counters. Passing the turn here. It could be over very, very soon now. It is nice to see, like, how good the Jalem Tome is in this, uh, in this match here. So there's the attack for five. I am going to draw a card. Knowing I'm not going to find anything. Going to go to 6. Or at least not something that can prevent the damage. He's going to tap 4. What else is he going to do here? Another creature? Armageddon! Oh, that is that crushes all my hopes here. The one of Armageddon in the deck of David found here. That is devastating. I was already dying, but this is horrible. So I think this is a win here for David. Oh, look at that. Look at my top deck. I had a Wrath of God at the top. If he wouldn't have played the Armageddon, I would have had enough mana to Wrath. And yes, it would have put me on three. You know, he still was in the driver's seat, but it, it would have given me some more time. And maybe I could have found a way out of this. But um, game number one, you're going to David because of that very well-timed Armageddon. That was really, really brilliant. And yeah, it is what it is. At least now I can use my transformational sideboard. Let's see if I can surprise David in game number two. Game number two, here we go. It looks like I've taken a mulligan starting here with six and a Mistress Factory dropping to five, passing the turn. Let's see what David can do. And uh, I've boarded in the creature, so I've used my transformational sideboard. Curious to see if that's going to work. Oh, land tax. Again, turn one tax. But now he's on the draw, so it's a lot better. Hopefully I can find a disenchant. There's the disenchant. Okay, this is great. That's really what you need, or else you're in this awkward position where you're like, do I want to play a land, activate his tax? That's not something you want to do, but it's kind of tough. It's his catch-22 scenario. Anyway, passing the turn here. Four cards in hand only, though. Let's see what David can do. A little bit in the tank here, it seems. I wonder what options he has. I mean, could go for, obviously, a land number two and, and maybe a Felwerstone or something, or maybe he's thinking about 
Keeping mana open. Okay, there's a mana vault. And now he's putting me in an interesting position, right? Am I going to animate the factory to deal some damage? Or is that too risky because of the one white open? Oh, look at that. Strip mining the scrubland. And then attacking. And there's a pass. Okay, so hopefully this strip is good. Maybe I can get him off of white. That would be really sweet. Remember, white gives him access to his complete control package. Disenchants, swords, the land taxes. Like his deck without white just doesn't have a lot of answers. So, oh, Fowerstone. Yeah, that's a problem. The Fowerstone, of course, can make white because I'm playing with white. That is annoying. I was hoping, really hoping, fingers crossed, that uh, the strip mine would make some more impact. There's another factory. So look at that playing quite aggressively here, animating and attacking. Am I going to get punished for it? Nope, I'm not. So he's going to drop to 15. You know, sometimes you got to take a little risk. But David now has got six mana. Remember, he's playing with four Triskelions, so he can cast a trike if he has one. Cannot play out White Knights. I wonder if they're still in his deck, though, because, you know, he's seen the bolts in game one. Perhaps chosen a different strategy. I also wonder if the Abyss is still in there. So remember, I'm now playing with creatures. I've got four Gargoyles, Granite Gargoyles, and also four Sarah Angels in the deck, I believe, after sideboarding. And David, again, really in the tank here. Trying to figure out the optimal line of play. And you can see on the playmat, the ATOC is also waiting for action. So four cards in hand for me. I wonder how many cards David has. I think about four as well, right? It looks like he's going to tap something here. Or is he simply thinking of animating, attacking for two, put me on 18? I am tapped out, so it's kind of safe to animate. Okay. Yeah, animating, attacking for two. Okay. Put me on 18. Look at that, tapping four. We're going to see a suit you. Armageddon. Okay, so that's why he needed so much time. Really thinking about this. It is risky, of course, because of that mana vault. But I'm sure he has his reasons. Passing the turn to me. There is a mountain and a pass. So at least it's going to activate his Felwer Stone. So the mana vault needs to stay tapped. He did take a damage for dropping to 14. There's a Plains. Okay. Does he have a land tax? Let's see what he can do with the white. So very interesting move to play this Armageddon. Of course, it did mean that uh, he took care of my two factories. There is another planes here for me. So I am finding lands, which is quite nice. I can't complain about that. Three cards in hand. No, four cards in hand, it seems, passing the turn. Ooh, look at that. A divine offering on his own vault here. That is good news for me because that card's really good against my deck as well. There we see the Jalem Tome again. Again, the little book. Drawing a card for turn. Let's see. What can I do? Going to go up to five. Ooh, not finding any lands though. So I was lucky at the start for finding those two lands, but now it kind of stopped. David still casting lands, tapping four. Oh man, that Icy Manipulator, that's a problem. There's a lot of glare on that side, by the way, but it's an Icy Manipulator. What he could start doing next turn is start tapping down my uh, one of my basics. There's another white, okay. Finding something. No Granite Gargoyle, though, even though I'm playing with four in the deck now. Would have been really sweet to play the Gargoyle here. Also, because next turn, David has mana probably open to tap down one of my lands. Probably the Mountain, considering I only have one of those. 
I mean, Icy Manipulator, I really enjoy playing the card myself, but playing against it, oh man. But that's of course with a lot of cards. I mean, I've got five in hand, I've got quite a lot of cards, only two it seems for David. It doesn't look like he's gonna animate here. I think he's just gonna pass. Or is he gonna play out something else? He is considering it another land. So now he's got four lands. So again, if I can find attacks, he's got more land than me. You know, that would be ideal. Okay, look at that, playing a Lightning Bolt in response to the tap of the Icy. And he's doing that, of course, during my upkeep. Untap, upkeep before I draw, tap the Mountain. So I'm emptying my hand here. That's interesting. Putting David on 12. So am I signaling a Wheel of Fortune here because I'm playing that Bolt or am I simply annoyed or do I have a lot of bolts in hand that I maybe want to go on the direct damage route a lot of options here Ooh, what are we gonna see there's a trike slamming down that trike 4-4 four, four. this is a problem I do have a swords though okay that's that is good that is good it's not ideal you can still deal three damage to me or take the four life Looks like he's going to do two damage to me, put it in his own graveyard. Remember, he is playing with an anime dead. Just a one-off, though. It looks like he needs some more time. I mean, he's got some considerations to do. He could just take the four life, go back up to 16. I think that's what he's considering here. So he's thinking, is it really that bad if I don't deal damage to my opponent who's still on 18? Yeah, I think he's going to take the life. And I think actually that that's an understandable decision. Remember, it's only playing one anime dead, so you don't really need it in the graveyard. And then those two points of damage to an opponent who's on 18, doesn't really matter. Maybe it's better for him to go back up to 16. No more cards in hand for him though. So I've got four and I've got that red mana. And if I remember this correctly, I think I was a bit confused in game one. If I remember this correctly, I do have a Wheel of Fortune in hand right now. The problem is, if I play a wheel, then, you know, I'm allowing David to untap with all his mana and a fresh hand, you know, and that's kind of suicide because he's got no cards in hand anymore. So that's why I'm not playing the wheel here. Uh, oh yeah, there's a Swords here on the Mishra's Factory. So he's gonna go back up. Look at that, he's all the way back up to 18. So all that early pressure, I guess, was for nothing, looking back at it. Although, I mean, without that pressure, he would have been like now maybe on 26. There's the uh, Suchi, by the way, which is looking quite good. Tapping four. Wrath of God, okay. And he's using the mana here. We're not playing with mana burn, by the way, but he's, use he's just using the mana. He told me he just wanted to do that. Uh, for the Jalem Tome. And to tap down his own Falver Stone, which is kind of funny. I mean, the thing is, both of our decks have a lot of answers, you know, because we're playing with white. And of course, I'm playing with bolts as well because I have red. He's got the Abyss because of uh, black. So we both have a lot of answers in our deck. Look at that. Also playing out a land. So this is probably because of that wheel. So I'm kind of trying to create the right moment to cast my Wheel of Fortune, but it's kind of tough because David hardly has any cards in hand. And of course, he's got the Jalem Tome as well. So I'm making Jalem Tome better when I cast the wheel. And it's really tough, you know, giving your opponent seven new cards. Tapping down the mountain, of course. So now I can't even cast it. Okay, there's a land tax. Oh, I wish I wouldn't have played that one planes earlier. I should have kept the Texan in hand, to be honest, I think, right? Because there's no surprise right now. So again, he's going to tap my mountain. If I would have just kept the tax, wait for him to drop uh, land number five, I could have just played the tax. And my deck actually doesn't need more than four lands. So again, what, what I notice when I see myself playing with this deck is I notice, oh, I don't play with these cards often. I really always need some time to kind of you know, get into the right mindset. There's a Tome activation. I mean, these are not major misplays, but I feel like you could just play the deck a little bit better and then 
you know, these things really do make a difference. Anyway, there's the, the Tome activation is going to discard the Swords to Plowshare. Still hasn't seen any creatures, even though they're in there. And I guess after sideboarding, five mana is kind of the sweet spot for me because I'm playing with Sarah Angel, so it's no longer four. So that kind of makes more sense than for dropping the extra land. There's a Suchi by David still uh, tapping down my uh, mountain during upkeep. Look at that playing another one. Does that mean that I have a Sarah Angel? Oh, I got a balance. Okay. Got a balance instead. I'm going to lose a lot of stuff. So playing this balance just to kill the Suchi. And he's got four lands, so I've got to drop another one. Tapping the planes for white, and then I have to probably put it in the bin. Need some time here to think about what I want to do. So passing the turn here back to David. So it looks like I've got, oh yeah, I've got four lands. David's got four lands. We both have two cards in hand. So fair enough. And I believe one of those two cards is the Wheel of Fortune. So I am thinking, do I want to cast a wheel? Don't I want to cast a wheel? Again, the problem is if I cast a wheel, my opponent gets to untap with all the, all the lands. So I'm really waiting for the right moment to use my Wheel of Fortune. And I mean, David is giving me the time for that, though. Like, here's another opening. He's got three cards in hand. I've got three cards in hand. Or did I find... A disenchant. Tapping three here. Okay, there's a divine offering. And now the question is, what am I going to get rid of? The Jalem Tome or the Icy? Again, a difficult, difficult spot. You know, there are just so many targets all the time. He's going to use Jalem Tome in response to me casting the divine offering. Yeah, I am going for the Tome here. I think the way I'm looking at it is I've got two red, two white, so it doesn't really matter what he taps down with the IC. And the Tome is immediate danger because it's card selection. This is a pretty long game too, by the way. Oh, there's a mind twist. Oh, oh look at that. Oh, losing the wheel. Yeah, that's the wheel I was talking about. So I was waiting for the right time, but I was just waiting way too long. And this is a lesson, right? This is a, sometimes you need to take a risk. I think I top decked that divine offering and I was like, oh, let me divine offering now. The next turn, I'm gonna, gonna play the wheel. Oh, 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 okay. Okay, finding a gargoyle. Now, of course, he can tap down the gargoyle with the icy. No cards in hand for me after the twist, of course. There is uh, the Swords to Plowshares. Oh man, that twist. That twist was brutal. But it's a, good, it's a good lesson. I just waited way too long with the wheel. If I would have wheeled, I also would have forced him to discard his twist, which is huge. At least I'm finding some nice cards from the top of the deck. Jade statue here, but remember he still has that uh, that icy. Let me know in the comments below if you would have played the divine offering on the icy or the Jalem Tome. I mean, Jalem Tome is no card advantage, of course. It's only card selection. Oh, look at this dust to dust. Really? From the sideboard, probably coming in here. That is a killer. Taking care of my jade statue and the mox pearl, but especially the jade statue really hurts. Dust to dust. That is really painful. I mean, this is a very interesting game. We're both having so many answers to threats. There's a disenchant talking about answers. And I'm running out of land taxes in my deck. And I haven't even had one activation out of it. Oh, man. This game is slipping away. Quickly now. I mean, there's the trike. Okay, tapping five. Do I have a Sarah? Yeah, but of course he can tap it down. If I would have known what cards I would draw in the future, obviously I would have played Divine Offering on the Icy, but I mean, the Jalen was just looking really good at that current situation. 
He's really running away here with the game, I feel. There is... Okay, he's going to flip. He's going to flip on the angel. Yep, that works. Angel is a goner. And now he can tap down again. Uh, probably my dual land next turn. Attack me for five as well after the flip, of course. So I'm going to drop to... It looks like I'm still on 17. Pretty high. But I mean, that's going to go quite fast. He can attack me for five every single turn. Finding a mountain really gave up on the, on the land tax plan. I think all my taxes are buried on the, in, in my graveyard. Oh, man. I felt like there were moments in this game where there were openings. He's actually attacking me for six, by the way, not for five. Okay, there is a bolt at least on the factory. That's something. I mean, I didn't draw that bad this match. I mean, yes, there were some unfortunate moments, but I really feel like I can get more out of this deck. Oh, there's a Suchi making matters worse. There's a Sarah Angel. It's not going to do much, but at least she's there. So now I'm finding my creatures here in this uh, last uh, part of this game number two. Pretty sure. Oh, there's also a, uh, a Maze of If. So many control elements here in the deck of David, and it, that's really killing me here. Eight damage dropping to five. So, I mean, next turn, he can he can finish it. Because, you know, I've already played out, like, cards like Balance and stuff. Maybe if I find Wrath of God. Wrath of God isn't out. Playing with two in the deck. I've only played one, I believe. Playing a Gargoyle. Okay, that's something, but not enough, though. It means I can jump block one of the creatures, but then because of the trike counters, he can still kill me. So he can just now tap down the Sarah Angel, attack with both. And then I used to try counters to finish the game. Yeah, tapping down the angel, attacking with both. I got a chump. And uh, that's the, uh, the victory here. Exactly the win here for David. Don't click away though, because we did play a game number three. I know a lot of people always appreciate it when we play a game three. So I asked David, do you have time? He said yes. So we're playing game number three and hopefully I can get my deck to work uh, in game three. But a big congratulations here to David for winning this match. And now we're going to shuffle back up again, maybe do some tweaks in the sideboard and we're going to go to game number three. Game number three. Here we go. Battling for the honor of my deck. Let's see what I can do. Mistress Factory passing the turn. There's a tax. Again, the tax. Can I find a disenchant again? There's a plateau. There's a disenchant. Okay, that's pretty good. Again, tax could be super annoying, you know. But in this case, it's fine. There's a soul ring. Passing the turn. So now I can, I guess I can attack for two here. Put him on 18. Put some pressure on. No Granite Gargoyle, unfortunately. Looks like he cannot find the three there. Okay, <laughs> there, there it is. Um, gargoyle would have been nice. I wonder if maybe I boarded out some creatures again. I can't remember. We'll just have to wait and see. Five cards in hand for me. I also wonder if David maybe changed something. I he told me that after the first game, he did board out the Abysses. So he wasn't playing with those in game two. The thing is with his deck, though, he still has access to the swords and, you know, he's got the disenchants for the other stuff. So he, he still has creature removal. He's got the balance as well, of course. Oh, look at this. Demonic tutor. What is he going to tutor for? Oh, is he going to go for another mind twist? That would be yucky. He's got, of course, the soul ring making the twist kind of good. I hope. Oh, this is maybe even worse. I wasn't even thinking about this. Didn't have a land drop yet. Library of Alexandria, oh god. Shall I tell you a secret? I boarded out my stone rains. So my only answers against this Library of Alexandria are strip mine, chaos orb. At least it's making the game kind of easy for me because what I need to do right now is just put pressure on my opponent. Playing a jade statue here. Unfortunately, I don't have an extra mana to also animate the factory and attack. 
But I think all that I can do now, you know, playing against a Loa, is it active already? Yeah, it's active already. Playing against an active Loa, if you cannot get rid of it, it just put as much pressure on your opponent as you possibly can and hope that he's going to whiff. You know, it happens. It happens. You know, people do lose with an active Loa. Not often, but it happens. Sometimes you just have really bad luck. This is interesting here. Okay, going for the Mana Vault and the Disenchant Plate. So then having six in hand, I guess. Is he going to go for the Soul Ring or the Jade Statue? Going to go for the Soul Ring. Okay, at least that I have enough mana to animate both and deal damage. He is tapped out. You know, he only has the Mana Vault. So you don't have to worry this turn about a Disenchant or a Swords to Plowshares. I mean, it's really tempting to just go for five here. It looks like that's exactly what I'm doing. So five damage to David, dropping to 13. I mean, I'm, I'm not there. But if, if you know, maybe he taps his fold at a certain point in the game and I can continue attacking. So he's going to draw back up to seven. He could just pass here, though, you know. Keep mana open for disenchant swords. Draw card number eight here. Perhaps he wants to have that land drop. Makes sense as well. I mean, I've got four in hand. He's got eight in hand with an active Loa. This is so bad. There's another Scrubland. Seven in hand, I believe, and pass. Oh, it's taking it back, though. Changing his mind. I wonder what he's thinking about. I mean, he's got, if, if, I, if I followed it correctly, I believe he's got eight in hand. I mean, there has to be a Swords and a Disenchant in there, you know. So he could just drop the land, pass, and then play out another card. He, he'll have six, you know, if he, if he Disenchants or Swords in my turn. But that doesn't matter. They don't just draw card number seven. After that, he can use the Loa again. So it seems kind of safe here to just play out a land, but... I wonder what he's thinking about. Maybe he's got Armageddon. Maybe he's thinking about Armageddon, which I wouldn't do yet. Because of that active low, I would wait a little bit longer. Then again, if you have all the ingredients already in your hand to win the game, you could consider dropping a land, playing Armageddon, because then all my lands are gone. I've got a Jade Statue I can't use. Now, do remember, he's only playing with the one of Armageddon in the main. He does play with two in the sideboard, though, so perhaps he boarded those in. Oh, this is really good. Another factory. This is really good. I think I just have to take a chance here. I mean, I'm, I'm expecting him to disenchant and, and, and sort my creatures away, but I have to take the risk. I cannot just pass turn here and, and, and watch David win the game with an active Loa. I got to take the risks here. Animating the factory. Oh, that's it. Not animating the, the, the Jade statue. So maybe I've got a disenchant in hand. Looks like he wants to tap something. Tapping a white. There's a Swords, though. And look at that. I'm not pumping it, so I guess I need the mana. Taking two life. Going to go up to 22, but who cares? Tapping three. What do I have? Oh, a Dust to Dust. That is actually quite good. Dust to Dust. Taking care of the Vault and the Soul Ring. So getting some value. So we saw David casting a really good Dust to Dust in game two. Now it's my turn. So also Dust to Dust coming from the sideboard. There's another Mana Vault. But, um, you know, he still has the active Loa. So it's very problematic for me still. Four cards in hand. What I could do here is just again try to attack for five. Looks like that's what I'm going to do. Pointing towards the statue, animating the statue, attacking for five. There's another Swords. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing when you're playing against an active Loa. He's going to have all the answers, you know. But at least I'm able to deal some damage. He's already on 11. Remember, I'm playing with Lightning Bolts as well. Um, I, I need a lot of luck, but you got to play towards your outs. David, of course, he just keeps drawing cards. Tapping four here. 
What is he going to do? Suchi, perhaps? Icy Manipulator. Yeah, that is super annoying. Maybe that's even more annoying. It's going to tap down my factory here, it seems. In response, though, I'm going to use the mana, play a Disenchant. Okay, this is quite nice. Because now he tapped the Volt to cast the Icy. So he's going to take a damage from his Volt, going to drop to 10. Then he's halfway. I'm being optimistic, I know, but you have to do something, right, in this position. And I mean, I think David's also not really finding the cards that he wants. He's unable to put any pressure on me, you know, if he would just play like a Suchi, for example, that would be great. That could, could stop the, uh, the factory as well, but hasn't been able to find one. And I mean, he's, he's already played out quite a lot of answers, I believe. I've seen a lot of swords from his side of the board. Using the Loa, so going... Uh, ooh, it looks like he's got nine cards now. There's a factory. Okay, that's, that's, that's decent for him. So I can offer him a trade next turn. Discarding here his Armageddon. I guess it's because of the Mana Vault, right? He doesn't want to Armageddon with the tap Mana Vault. Animating, attacking here. So offering him a trade, or do I have something in hand to kill the... The factory. Animating. Remember, the, the factory of David still has summoning sickness, so he cannot pump it to a 3-3. So we are going to trade. I mean, I'm just surprised that I'm still in this. Right? I'm happy with that fact. So we're trading. The problem now is I've got no more pressure on the board. Jade statue gone. Both factories gone. He is dropping to 9 because of his own mana vault. I'm kind of clinging on to that mana vault damage. And I don't think I've played a single bolt yet. So he's on nine. That's three bolts. I wonder how many tax edges I'm still playing on land taxes. I can't remember. I know I boarded them out after the first game. And then after game two, I started boarding back in the taxes, I think. There's a land tax. Exactly. Okay. Okay. This is quite good, you know. I have an active tax now, finally. That can give me some card advantage as well. So, it's actually not going that bad. I mean, if I can just get take some basics out of my library, I also have a bigger chance of, of, of hitting the, the bolts, maybe even finding a, a, a Lance Edge. I'm just trying to dig in my memory. I think what I've done if I put the three land taxes back and one Lance Edge back in the deck. For game number three. That's that's what I believe I did. And for game two, I believe I took out uh, most of the land taxes. Maybe I kept one in and I took the land's edges out. So it's quite interesting. And like I said, David told me that after game two, he boarded out the abysses. I don't think he boarded those back. But I mean, his deck has a lot of answers. He put, it, he put in a lot of, of artifact hate. And an extra disenchant, I believe. And of course, those cards work really well against my Jade Statues and Mistress Factories. And then he still has the, the Swords to Plowshares to deal with the Sarah Angels and the Granite Gargoyles. He's really in the tank here trying to think, do I want to untap my Mana Vault or do I want to go to 8? If I go to 8, what does that mean? And I think the reason he's thinking about it is that when you go to 8, and remember, he's seen my Lance Edge in Game 1, so he knows I'm playing with it. Uh, or could play with it, of course, because it's after sideboarding, that if I can find the Lance Edge, I only need four lands when he's on eight, because they, they deal eight damage. But when he's on nine, I need five lands, and that one land can make a difference. Oh, look at that Mind Twist again! I get Mind Twist in every single game! Double Bolt, though! Bam! Brilliant! Putting him on two. And, uh, oh, losing a lot of lands. That, that, that Mistress Factory kind of hurts. That really hurts. Because that's pressure on the board. David's a really nice guy, by the way. But, um, oh man, getting, getting mind twisted three times. Ah, that hurts. Anyway, um, at least, I mean, it's not too bad, you know. Um, David's on two. 
and I've got an active tax. So I'm not that unhappy. I just need to find something to put pressure on the board. Maybe a uh, granite gargoyle, you know? Play out a gargoyle, I can win. If he doesn't have an answer. It looks like he's going to untap the vault now. And that's going to cost him an entire turn almost, right? So this is really good for me. Oh, look at that. A divine offering on the mana vault. And I'm doing this, of course, in his upkeep after he's untapped it. So untap, upkeep, pay to four, untap the vault in response, play the, the divine offering. And I mean, this is taking him a turn. Look at that, just passing. I'm, I'm a little bit surprised, not even a land drop. Because now he's got five lands if I count the Loa as well. And he needs six to kind of like play a trike, for example. Drawing a card for turn. So I've got seven in hand, I believe. Six of those are lands, basic lands. <laughs> Playing a mountain and passing the turn. It could be that I want to go to five. Maybe I found a Sarah. Could be the case. I mean, if I would have found a Gargoyle, I would have slammed it on the board anyway. Because I think David has played out quite a lot of sorts to Plowshares. Still, he's got a full hand, of course. Tapping five, it seems. What is five? It's kind of hard to see with the glare, though. Okay, there's a Suchi, so perhaps it's just four. I mean, Suchi's decent. I think the, another problem for David here is my life total. Look at my life total. I'm really high up. I'm on 26. He hasn't really been able to deal any damage. Yeah, exactly. So he tapped five, but he, yeah, this is better. So he's got four, he's got a scrubland untapped, and he's got a uh, Library of Alexandria untapped. And of course, I'm going to continue taking my basics out of my deck because all I want to find is Lightning Bolt number three or Lightning Bolt number four to close the deal, or at least uh, Granite Gargoyle, Sarah Angel that I can cast if I, I have a land, so I can just drop land five. Something to put pressure on the life total. Tapping five here. Are we going to... Hey, Sir Angel! Okay, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. If he doesn't have... What does he need? He just needs a Swords, I think. Icy is gone. Only plays with one Icy. Icy is gone. He needs he needs a Swords. Balance is gone. Then again, if even if he has a Balance... Well, Balance is not gone, but Balance is not going to help him because of the, the Suchi. So even if he attacks, I should just take the 4 damage, not take the risk. Or, or make the trade. I mean, I'm never going to do that anyway, I think. But then again, I've done pretty stupid moves in Magic. Which is weird because I play it so often, but I still make the dumbest mistakes. So let's see what David's going to do here. He is really digging for answers. Am I going to win this? That would be really sweet. I mean... You know, David already, of course, won the match after the first two games, being uh, very uh, convincing with his deck. Nope, I don't. What what card is that? I can't see it. I can't see it. Oh, it's an Armageddon. No, that's not going to help him. Oh, winning. Game number three. And it kind of feels like a match win. You know, it feels like a match win. Whenever you win against an active Loa, it's, it's always a kick. And um, I also know what it's like, David, to lose when you have an active Loa. You always feel like, did I do something wrong? But sometimes these things just happen. You're unlucky, uh, you know, or, or you whiff, or you only find mana sources, or don't find the mana sources, or, you know, these things happen sometimes. Um, yeah, it is It is what it is. And of course, uh, David's still the winner, though, of this match. And here you can see uh, his deck, Abyss Knights. It was a lot of fun to uh, to play against you, David. And uh, thank you, of course, for supporting the channel as a patron. That's really, really appreciated. If you also want to play a game against me, then please consider becoming a patron of the show. Check out patreon.com slash timmytalks for all the info. And before you go on your way out, please take a moment to like, share, and comment uh, on this uh, video. All this is completely free and really helps the channel move forward. And for now, all I can say is thank you very much for watching another episode on Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And let's go to the end scroll.
Bumba Kazik. <laughs>